بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وآله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Hadith class فقه في Hadith class Today inshallah we will conclude with the book of transactions We've reached Hadith number 281 Narrated Ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما Umar ibn al-Khattab got some land in Khaybar and he went to the Prophet wasallam to consult him about it saying, O oh Allah's Apostle, I got some land in Khaybar better than which I have never had. What do you suggest that I do with it? The Prophet wasallam said, If you like, you can give the land as endowment and give its fruits in charity. So Umar gave it in charity as an endowment on the condition that would not be sold nor given to anybody as a present and not to be inherited, but its yield would be given in charity to the poor people, to the kith and kin, for freeing slaves for Allah's cause to the travelers and guests, and that there would be no harm if the guardian of the endowment ate from it according to his need with good intention and fed others without storing it for the future. This is a beautiful hadith, and it is a principle, basic principle for endowment in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandated zakah and specified the recipients of the zakah. He specified how to spend it. But what if he wanted to seek other means also? Again, Islam gave us solutions. One of these solutions is endowment. Endowment is a great tool to fight poverty. It is a great way to maintain and generate money for the good cause for Islamic causes. Here in this hadith, let's go to the details. Amr ibn al-Khattab got some land in Khaybar. How he got this land? It is after the conquest of Khaybar. He got this land. The land was divided because Khaybar was opened and the Muslims took control. So he got this land. Now what is the status of this land? Umar told the Prophet وسلم, that I never got more precious, more expensive property than this land. Imagine you worked hard for 20 years to get your retirement home, to get your dream home, or to get that nice car. You paid these installment payments until you got this car. This is the most expensive thing. Usually when you have a very expensive thing, what do you do with it? You hide it, you keep it. That's why we have safe deposit boxes in banks because we keep valuable things. But what did Umar radiallahu do? Because it is very, very valuable, he asked the Prophet وسلم, how to give it in charity. Look at their level of Iman. Unlike many of us, unfortunately, when we use the things, when we are tired of them, when clothes are worn out, then we give them in charity. And that is not the character of the Muslim. The believer, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not attain righteousness until you spend of what you love. While we tend to spend of what we don't love. Laptop, I used it for two years. Now it is old. I say I'll donate it. Well, how about saving money for six months, buying a laptop and then giving it in charity? Who would do that? If you want to attain righteousness, that's what you do. You spend of what you love, not of what you hate, what you want to live. So, he came to the Prophet ﷺ. Again, look how they referred every single matter to the Prophet ﷺ. They don't come after everything is over, when it is too late, and they just ask, how can we get away with it? How can we fix the matter now? How, what do we do? No. Before he does anything, he came and asked the Prophet ﷺ, telling him, 
What do you suggest, O Messenger of Allah? Because they love the Prophet What was the response of the Messenger If you like, again look at the prophetic style. I come to you and I ask you, so I am willing to listen to you. Prophet ﷺ did not tell him you have. He told him, if you like, if you want. Again, that is one way to push people to do what you want. Can you? Would you? Instead of, I need, you have to. Prophet ﷺ told him, if you want. Although he wants to, that's why he asked the Prophet ﷺ. But again, the Prophet ﷺ does not force people. He did not want to force him, so he suggested to him. Always try to use suggestion. It has better effect on people instead of command. We don't like commands. I don't like anybody to command me. Even if it was a child, he doesn't like others to command him. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, if you like, you can give the land as endowment. And look at the long vision of the Prophet ﷺ. How? He guided him to endowment, something that we lack a lot nowadays, especially here in America. Unfortunately, we don't focus on endowment. Look at other people, non-Muslims. They give endowments. They pay a lot. And that's how their project survived. Because when you give it endowment, what will happen? It will become continuous. Now, this land, this property, this precious property, if the Prophet ﷺ told him to donate it, just give it in charity, divide it on poor people. You have five poor people, divide it to five divisions and give each one of them one division. What will happen then? You give it one time. Next year, what will happen? You need to give something else because that one is already gone. If a poor man comes to you, he asks you for money. And you gave him money. He, he said, I only want to eat. Feed me. And you fed him. Tomorrow what he will do? He will come again and ask. He wants you to feed him. But if you taught him how to work, and that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ told the man, to go to the wood. To bring wood. He asked for money. And the Prophet ﷺ saw him able to work. So he guided him. The same thing here. The concept of endowment is almost absent. It's almost absent. Earlier, 500 years, 1,000 years ago, it was one of the most powerful resources. You heard of the names of many, many scholars. But one of the reasons why they were great scholars, because all what they focused on is the knowledge. They did not have to worry about work. The Muslim Ummah sufficed them. They told them, you spend your time on knowledge. And that's exactly what they did, because... One rich man comes and he says, this is endowment. This is a land, a lot, in prime location. Everything that is generated from here is going to be spent on the students of knowledge. In some places, it was designated according to your school of thought. So the Hanbalis, they have their endowment. The Shafi'is, they have their endowment, and so on and so forth. Sometimes there were endowments even for animals. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ say, in every living soul, in every living creature, there is a sadaqah, there is a charity? Muslims reach that level. Not any animals. The abandoned animals. Abandoned animals, instead of being left, wandering, there was endowment. One man or group of people came, and they reserved a land. Every strayed animal is kept there and taken care of there. And this land, until now, it is known in Damascus. It is in prime location. Unfortunately, of course, now it is taken. It is in prime location, but it used to be the land of the abandoned animals. Abandoned animals. There was endowment for the slaves. The slaves are second-class citizens. And it is easy to punish them. Who would blame you if you punished your slave? 
one of the reasons to punish your slave if he, if he messed up your things. There was an endowment if a slave broke something. You bring that broken thing and they give you replacement from that endowment. They reach that level of civilization through endowments. And it started here from the Prophet ﷺ. When he told Umar, if you wish, you keep the land as endowment. So what happens when you keep the land as endowment? The fruit is coming every year. And you are spending the fruit, but the land is there. So you get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is what? It is not one time charity. It is forever. It is a charity forever. So now we need to focus on this. And actually there are some projects, but it takes some time. We are very, very late. But at least let us try to start. Because we have to do this. There has to be endowment. Why the people, they have to worry. Actually, if you are a Muslim, just by being a Muslim, you should be sufficed. We come together, and you are not doing this. When you do this, you are not doing this as a favor for poor people. You are rewarded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you will benefit yourself. And at the same time, you are benefiting others. Wallahi, I, it amazes me when I see non-Muslims and they are doing the endowments generously for educational institutions, for religious people that are not Muslims. But look at the Muslims. Now, in Kuwait, for instance, one of the most organized countries when it comes to endowment. If you want to endow a masjid, they don't allow you unless you build a house for the imam. Masjid, next to it, there has to be a house or apartment. In some places, there are endowments for the salaries. Why the government would pay them? There are successful businesses and they are paying people. There are some rich people from specific countries, like from Algeria, for instance. They came to Mecca and they noticed that prices are going high and higher. They purchased a hotel and they endowed that hotel. Anyone coming from Algeria, he sits there for free. It is purchased. It is owned now. I, I can do whatever I want with it. Imagine if we thought of this concept. Endowment. Even in, at Aris, I told some people here, they say, we can give you every month. And I say, if you give me every month, that is not guaranteed. Because you gave me this month, next month, maybe you are not here. Which is still better than giving one time. But instead, if you have some ability, bring some, some people, purchase a land, purchase a house, let's rent it, and whatever is coming, this becomes endowment. That's only one idea, and there are many, many ideas. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, before I come here, there is a private school. It is not even a college. It is a private school. One of the top private schools in America. Albuquerque Academy. Two people, they are Jews, a husband and wife. They endowed $100 million. $100 million to that school. They were invited and they were happy with the activities of that school. So they endowed all their money to that school. Imagine how Harvard University and other universities, how they survived. They did not start with this lots of assets that they have. They started from one mansion, from a small house, and that's how they grew. So we need to switch our thinking. We need to focus on this. This is the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So the Prophet wasallam guided him and told him, this is the best you could do. So Umar radiallahu an gave it in charity. How he gave it in charity? Endowment is still, it is a charity. It is a charity. On the condition, and this is another thing, you are the one who endowed this, so you can put any condition you want. I want this only for women. We need an endowment for poor women. If she is divorced, there is no way where for her to go. Where is she going? Only for women. Only for sick people, only from that. On the condition that would not be sold, 
nor given to anybody as a present. Because if you gave it, that's it, it's gone. While you keep it, you keep the asset, but the fruit is given. And not to be inherited. So whatever condition you, you do, you are allowed to. But its yield would be given in charity to the poor people. Now, since you said it is to charity, to who? You can specify. But basically, we look from the condition of Umar radiallahu anh, it is to everybody. It is to everybody. The needy, the poor, the kinship. So endowment could be for anybody. Does it have to be for people who are poor? And the answer is no, not necessarily. This is your choice, your money. You decided to give it on that condition. You are allowed to. Can the guardian of that endowment be paid from it? Of course. Can he eat from it? Yes. But again, with the condition, with good faith. Bil ma'roof. With what is known. Now, $2,000 are enough for you. This land is making $20,000. It is haram for you to take $10,000. And you say, this is bil ma'roof. No. If 2000 is enough for you, you take that. You take a little bit extra, but you don't store. You don't keep up. So, this is the endowment, and this is one example only. But it is sufficient. We need to focus on this endowment. In many places, there was endowment for a'imma, for the imams. Whoever is working for this job, we just want him to be busy with that job. Because he will give you better quality. Because if he's busy, there is endowment for judges. The judge does not have time if his wife asked him, if his daughter asked him, he has a judgment, he has a case he needs to focus on. He will be busy. Do I have enough money to pay my bill? Do I have? He will not give you a good job. But again, unfortunately, now many people don't realize that. You deal with the problem from the end part, while actually you, you should start from the root, the grass root of it. And here, there is a solution. This is what Umar Adilan did. And when we study the life of Umar Adilan, we see that he wanted to do the same thing with the lands that were opened. Because he saw the fruit of the guidance from the Prophet ﷺ. So this is the hadith of endowment. The next hadith. Narrated Umar radiallahu anh, I gave a horse to be ridden in Allah's cause. And the person who got it intended to sell it or neglected it. Again, subhanAllah, look how Umar was generous. He gave a horse in the cause of Allah. He found someone who is in need and he gave him a horse in the cause of Allah. But this man wanted to sell it. Now, when you give me a gift, because it is a gift, I can do whatever I want with it. This man neglected it. So I wanted to buy it, as I thought he would sell it cheap. Since it was a gift, you will not sell it for the same price. You will bargain. I consulted the Prophet ﷺ. Again, look at Umar radiallahu anh. Subhanallah, how he was guided. Every time he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Look at their iman. He asked the Prophet ﷺ, consulted him, do you think it is good to, to buy this horse? Usually it may cost 100 dirhams or 200 dirhams. That is the cost of the horse. Maybe he will sell it for 40 dirhams. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not buy it even if for one dirham. Not even for one dirham. Because he would... He who takes back his gift is like a dog, swallowing its vomit. Because he who takes back his gift is like a dog, swallowing its vomit. Now, in this hadith, what do we see happening? Umar gave the gift and then he wanted to take it back. How he wanted to take it back? By paying money for it. But the Prophet ﷺ still considered it what? Taking back your gift. Why? Now, is, it, is, is there harm on you? If you give a gift as 
uh, you gave someone a gift as a car. And then you lost your car. You wanted to purchase a car. And you found the car that you gave as a gift. Someone, the one that took it from you, he wanted to sell it regularly. There is no harm on you to take it. But here, in this case, Umar radiallahu an felt that he would make a good deal. He would save lots of money. That's why it was considered as revoking your gift. Is taking back your gift allowed or not? According to the majority of scholars, no, based on this hadith. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, it is allowed. Because what about the dog? If you saw a dog vomiting and licking its vomit, what is it with it? It is a dog. <laughs> so Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, said it is abominable only, it is not haram. But the majority of scholars said, no, it is not allowed. There are specific cases, as we mentioned earlier, like the, the husband or the spouse in the case of engagement. And then we have the father. He is allowed to take back his gift if he gave his son. But in general, don't take back your gift. Don't take back your gift. Why? Again, how would you feel? If I took back something, I gave it to you. And I told you this is a gift. On the other hand also, when you do something for the sake of Allah, then keep it for the sake of Allah. Don't ask for a reward in this life. You said it is for the sake of Allah, so keep it this way. Don't take it for dirham. While it's worth much more than that. That's why when you sacrifice, do you sell the meat? You sacrificed, you pleased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you want to make business. No. You said it is for the sake of Allah, so it is for the sake of Allah. Next hadith. Hadith 284. Narrated an Nu'man ibn Bashir, radiallahu an. My father donated to me some of his property. My mother, Amra bint Rawaha, said, I shall not be pleased until you make Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a witness to it. My father went to Allah's Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in order to make him the witness of the donation given to me. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said to him, to my father, have you done the same with every son of yours? He said, no. Thereupon, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, fear Allah, and observe equity in case of your children. My father returned and got back the gift. Now, this is basically about the gift. Some of the basic things about the gift. And the main point in this hadith is justice in regards to the gift. The hadith says, my father donated to me some of his property. What was that property? It is not mentioned here. In another hadith, it was mentioned. He gave him a slave. And that is, that is very precious property, by the way. You give someone a servant, imagine. So he gave him this gift. Look at the righteousness of the mother. She did not say, MashaAllah, my son, you have now a gift. She said, I will not be happy with it until you make Allah's messenger as a witness. So she wanted to confirm. Look at the people when money was not really the issue. Pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the issue. You got the money. If it is lawful, alhamdulillah. If it is not lawful, we don't want it. She said, I will not be pleased until you make, Allah, uh, you make Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a witness. My father went to Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in order to make him the witness of the donation given to me. And again, look how the companions always referred in every matter to the Prophet Wasallam, And that's why they were guided. That's why they were pra uh, praised by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's why they were successful. Nowadays, the last thing we focus on is pleasing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We do the thing, and then we focus on how can we maximize the Prophet. And then after that, if something wrong happened, we look and we say, let's see, is this Islamic or no? Let's see how can we get away with it. Let's see if this can be fixed while it is too late. You see people coming to you, asking you advice after three years. Where were you three years ago? 
when it is too late, you think that I have a magic rod that I can help you? Allah's Messenger وسلم, said to him, have you done the same with every son of yours? That means as a gift given to one of your children, you ha it has to be equal. That means even a gift which is something that you're allowed to do and you don't have, still if you did it, you have to do it equally. Because did his father have to give him a gift? To his son? No, he did not have to. Then why he gave him a gift? He wanted him, maybe he was good to him, maybe he pleased him, so he wanted to reward him. But even in that case, when you are fully having the option, still you cannot give one of your children. What if this child is more righteous? You have another child, he is wicked, he disobeys you. You want to encourage him, so you give him a gift and you leave that one. Aren't you allowed to do this? Why not? Based on this hadith. But this man is doing injustice to you as a father. He is undutiful. Still, if he did something wrong, if he did injustice, that does not mean you deal with him, you treat him equal. Prophet ﷺ said, fear Allah to the father and observe equity in case of your children so deal with them all equally what if your child is five years old and the other one is 18 years old the one who's 18 years old he needs a car the one who is five years old he needs PlayStation or or scooter what do you do with this how do you guarantee that when he grows up, you will have a car ready for him. Or you have a son who needs to go to college and you need to pay him $4,000 per semester. While another son is asking you for only $500 to, to purchase cell phone, something, a laptop, and you did not. Do you have to give your son $4,000 just like the one that you gave? No. Why not? Based on the needs. But here, in this case now, are all children the same age? In case of a Nu'man radiallahu anh. So maybe not all of them needed a slave. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you put in like whatever amount and then increase so much. And then your second child comes and you do the same thing. But what, is the initial amount that's what matters in this case? Yeah, now in this case, when you put fund and you put it equally, but this one grew and that one did not grow, this is because of you or because of outside circumstances, uncontrollable things. So you did your best. You did your best. But preferring a child over another, not because you want to prefer, but because this is his needs and that is his needs. Here, it is a case, uh, a case where the issue needs to be studied further because some people said this is allowed, others said no. Still, you have to deal with them equally because this one, if he grew up and he did not find the same opportunity as the previous one, then you already did injustice. Do you guarantee that your child, when he becomes 18, you will be able also to pay him for college. That is the thing that you need to ask yourself. Next hadith. Narrated Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, contracted with the people of Khaybar, the trees. He contracted them on the condition that he would have half the property of fruits and harvest. Half the property of fruit and harvest. Now we know when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Khaybar, the Jews told the Prophet ﷺ that you are not expert in this land. If you take it fully, it will not produce as it is producing. So keep us and we will pay you. You benefit and we benefit. Did the Prophet ﷺ agree? He did agree. 
How he agreed, what was this contract? What's the nature of this contract? This contract is a partnership. While they work, and he gets half of the fruit and harvest. So it is what? 50-50. Is that allowed? Is this allowed? Didn't we say that muhaqala and is haram? Mukhabara. That's when you take from a certain section of a land. So what's the case here then? From the total. Here, the risk is on both of you. Because you don't know how much the land will produce. It may produce 1,000 pounds. So you get 50, 500 pounds. It may produce 200 pounds. So you will get 100 pounds. So in this case, the risk is on both of you. And that is partnership. This is allowed. This is allowed. While on the other case, when you contract someone on part of the land, this part may not produce. And you as a worker may focus on this part because this is what you will get. So this term, this contract is called muzara'a, from zira'a. Agriculture. Zara'a, to plant. Muzara'a, this is called muzara'a. Muzara'a is permissible because you are agreeing on a percentage that is variable for you and for the person. And look at the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ also here. That he contracted them and it was 50-50. Nowadays we have many cases like that. You come with an idea but you don't have the money. You have someone who has the money, but you know for sure that he won't be able to do this project. So you agree with him. It may be 50-50, it may be more, it may be less. It depends. He is an investor. He does nothing. He just supplies you with money, provides you with money. You are the mind. Again, this is the solution, the Islamic solution for interest. Now, people, many people say, I don't have money. This is the only option. No, this is not the only option. Unfortunately, the banks made it the only option. You go to the bank and they give you money. And they take it back from you with interest. What if you lost? They don't care. While here, you will not trick them because you want to make more profit. The more profit, yes, it will help them, but it will help you also. That's what they don't understand. So, this is an Islamic solution for interest, for riba. Every single transaction, we have solution for it in Islam. But unfortunately, people are not paying attention to this. Next hadith. Narrated Rafi' ibn Khadij, radiyallahu anhu. We worked on farms more than anybody else in Medina. Mashallah, they were farmers. We used to rent the land at the yield of specific delimited portion of it. To be given to the landlord. Is this allowed? Is this allowed? Then how they used to do it? Well, he said sometimes the vegetation of that portion was affected by blight. By a disease. While the rest remained safe and vice versa. Sometimes this is the case. So it is risk here. On one side only. So the Prophet wasallam forbade this practice. Okay, so this is forbidden to contract someone on specific part of the land. A similar situation here when you have, for instance, a factory, a clothing line, and you say, I will get the profits or the sales of the black color. What if nobody purchased black color? Isn't that deception? So what is the difference between this transaction and the previous one? The previous one is muzara. This one is mukhabara. This is forbidden. We already took it. This one is allowed. Uh, this one is pro prohibited. The previous one is allowed. Because this one here, you are contracting on a specific portion. Specific portion, it may produce and it may not. <coughs>
The next hadith narrated Hanzala bin Qais. I asked Rafi' bin Khadij, again the same narrator, previous narrator, about renting the land for dinars and dirhams. Can you rent the land? You come to someone and you tell him, I will pay you ten dollars, hundred dollars. He replied, there is no harm in renting for dinars dirhams. It is allowed. People used to rent the land in the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam for the yield of the banks of water st uh, streams or for a portion of the yield stipulated by the owner of the land. So, what's, what do we understand from this hadith? First of all, can you rent for money? What about the second part where he says people used to rent the land in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ for the yield of the banks of water streams or for a portion of yield stipulated by the owner? Is that allowed? Is that allowed? Yeah, that's more fertile, so that will produce more. That's not allowed, right? So how, he said, people used to rent this land in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. They used to do it, but he forbade them. Exactly. In another narration, it came clearly, but the Prophet ﷺ forbade them. And we don't even need that continuation, because here in this hadith, he was asked about dirhams and dinars. So he told him, this is allowed, and that's what was done. So that's what is prohibited. He's telling you this is allowed, and he is giving you another, another example of what is not allowed. Okay? So again, it is the same transaction. For dirhams, for money, this is allowed. But for a portion, specific land, this is not allowed. Are they the same? They are not the same. Again, they may look the same, but they are not. Next hadith, the Prophet ﷺ gave the verdict that Umrah is for the one to whom it is presented. Umrah, not Umrah. Remember, there is Umrah, which is visiting the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any time of the year for the purpose of ibadah. And there is Umrah. Umrah related to the Umr. The age. This is another type of gift. But it is a long term gift. Subhanallah in Islam we have permanent gift which is like a charity or endowment. And then we have one time gift. And then we have long term gift which is this one. If you give someone a gift on the condition that it is for him until he dies. Once he dies, you get it back. Is that permissible? It is permissible. This is what is called Umrah. Means until his lifetime. Or until your lifetime. Once you die, what will happen? It will go back to your heirs or to the people benefiting from you. Subhanallah, look how many transactions we have. Next hadith narrated Aisha radiallahu anha. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Whoever usurps even one span of the land of somebody. His neck will be encircled with it down the seven earths. مَنْ ظَلَمَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ قِيدَ شِبْرٍ طُوِقَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنْ سَبْعِ أَرَضِينَ This is about usurpation. This is about taking something unjustly. Unfortunately, nowadays, this is the norm. If you can take something by law, even if you know it is not yours, you will do it. You will do it. While Islamically you should not. If it's not yours, even if it was what? Span. Even if it is the size of the span. 
What will happen to you? On the day of judgment, you will come while this thing that you took unjustly will be encircled on your neck down to the seventh earth. Just to show you how severe is the punishment. And the Prophet ﷺ said that injustice is multiplied on the Day of Judgment. It will be darknesses. Not only one darkness, darknesses on the people on the Day of Judgment. الظُّلْمُ ظُلُمَاتٌ يَوْمَ القيامة. So do not take anything unjustly. It won't Legalize it if you took it by law, if it doesn't belong to you. Because there is a day of judgment where you will give it back and it will become punishment for you. And we will stop here, inshallah.